Good morning. Happy New Year, everybody. Good to see you guys. I, I made a New Year's resolution to dress a little nicer the first weekend of the year. So enjoy it, all right? We're tucked in. This is all stuff that's in the closet. It just doesn't come out very often, and it kind of feels good. So I might do it again next year, same time. Be here. It really is good to see you. Welcome all our locations because this is our story series. This is my favorite thing that we do in the year. I mean, I love to teach the Bible, but for me, it's all about the gospel. It's the story of God working in and through us as people. And that story is different uh, with each one of us because we're unique and we're designed by God in his image, but we have different perspectives and backgrounds. And so today's guest is someone I'm super excited to introduce to you, and so I just got to get right to it. Dr. Caroline Leaf is a, a best-selling author. She's a Christian cognitive neuroscientist, obviously, and uh, she, she's going to have to explain what that is to some of us, and that, that's part of the talk, but she has, she's a mental health expert. She's written extensively 17 books and just has so much passion in helping all of us understand how God created us, and how we can get in step with that. So will you please help me welcome Dr. Caroline Leaf. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much. Nice to be here. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Do you know why you're here? I think so. Okay, because oh, <laughs> this is how it happened. My wife, well, she listens to a lot of uh, Christian podcasts and things, usually while I'm watching surfing videos. And so we have, you know, we have different perspectives on what we want to be entertained by. And I hear a lot of voices through her phone, especially when she's getting ready in the morning. And so she's by her mirror, and I hear this voice that's kind of like a bad Australian accent because it's uh, South African, so which is better than Australian. But anyway, so I hear this, this lady talking in this accent, I'm like... Okay, and, and she's talking about things that I don't usually hear people talk about. Yeah. And so I come in, and before you know it, we're both getting ready in front of my wife's mirror, watching you on her phone. I'm like, this lady's amazing. So Thank you. That's welcome funny. to Real Life. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I love what you... Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and why you do it. So I'm, as you mentioned, a cognitive neuroscientist, but I've spent the last 30 years researching the mind-brain connection. So looking at the power of the mind and how we can think and the science of thought and how thoughts build and, and can we control this and this whole thing of renewing our mind, is it true and so on. So I've done clinical trials, research, I've practiced for 25 years and now I basically put all this into books and DVDs and TV shows and whatever and I go around the world teaching people that they're brilliant, they have an incredible mind and that we can actually live the lives that God has designed us to live, which is exciting. It is exciting. And Help me with this, because one of the things that I get asked a lot is there's, there's science and then there's faith. And the way our generation looks at this right now is they're pretty much incompatible. You have science, which is observation of how things work, and it's fact, and it's knowledge. And so uh, I get a lot of people that say, well, that's cool. You believe in God. I, I kind of believe in science. You're a Christian neuroscientist. Do you find those things incompatible? No, not at all. And I can't understand why people would even begin to think they're incompatible. Because if, you th if we believe God is the source of all knowledge, why is the studying of this knowledge a problem? Why is it suddenly unspiritual to study the knowledge that God has given us? That means that we must all stay completely ignorant, if you think of it, if you take it from that perspective. So science is simply the study of knowledge. The word science comes from the word sclera, which means knowledge. And God is the source of all knowledge. So science isn't just dealing with brain science or physics. It's dealing with every single kind of bit of knowledge in the world. So it's whether it's from um, education to physics to botany to whatever it is, how a computer works, how to design a house, how to create the fabric on the stage, on those chairs. I mean, every single thing is knowledge. And God is the source of knowledge. So science is the study of knowledge. So they're totally compatible. And as we learn more about science, so we learn more about God. 
Science is also very practical. It shows us how we function, which all of us actually, if, you, if, you're, if you're a Christian and you actually um, believe in God and you believe that God is the source of all knowledge and everything, if you go to the doctor, then you're applying that knowledge. So that's science. So then if you don't believe science is compatible with God, don't go to the doctor, don't, don't use a computer, don't wear clothes, don't eat. You know what I'm saying? That's, like a, that's how stupid it actually is if you think okay. of it. Yeah, she wasn't <laughs> suggesting any of those and especially the clothes one, but go ahead. Well, <laughs> I had to wake you all up. <laughs> But that's really how we've got to be careful how we look at things. You know, we, like, we create these dichotomies that are actually not realistic. So it's know? interesting because I, I was sort of asking that question from the perspective of a lot of non-believers attack the faith. But you're actually, the way you answered it really is, because that's the other side of it. I think a lot of times people of faith are afraid of science. Yes. And so we're afraid of new knowledge. And for me, I get excited every time there's a new discovery, there's a new, I think, okay, how can we take what we've now learned as we're like glimpsing into the universe or into the cellular microbiology, whatever we discover is going to point me to God. It, it never scares me about, oh no, they just found out something that means God's irrelevant. It maybe gives me a clue of who God is or how he did something. Exactly. But a lot of Christians are scared of knowledge of science. But also our generation is very, uh, th if they're science-based, they feel like, Faith and science, the mysterious, the intangible, really can't be uh, compatible with science and knowledge. That's come a lot from a very dominant materialistic viewpoint, which started mm -hmm. in with back 350 years ago with the with Newton's discoveries. And Newton was a theist. He believed that he believed in God and believed that every law can be broken. But that's not how his work was, all, was totally interpreted. And we create, we, we live in a very materialistic world. That, and when I say materialistic, I'm not talking about having material things. I'm talking about how man is viewed. And a materialistic view says that the physical is the most important and that the brain, for example, produces the mind. So they're seeing the physical, they try and track everything back to what you can see, touch, hear, feel. So anything that's on the, that you can't on the subatomic level, the mind, all these consciousness, all these things called the hard question of science, consciousness, and so on. They, there's, there's definitely a large body of people that are very wary of dealing with what they can't see. They right. prefer to stick around what they can see. Meanwhile, the science is very accurate. And this, that, so scientists are saying that their own field is not kind of, there's a lot of paradoxes because the research, and this is something I've been involved in for 30 years as well, is looking at the, the, non, the non conscious or the non physical, the spiritual side of man and how that links in with the physical side. And we see that it's 99% of who we are. So we, on a spiritual, when we talk about spiritual in church, we're talking about non-physical on a scientific level. And it's the same thing. It's just two different ways of saying the same thing. Right. But we see that we're 99% just um, non-physical. So if our dominant part of who we are is this non-physical, spiritual, very real quantum nature that's eternal and, and impacts and influences the physical, we can't ignore that. So there is an approach in science. You think 99% is yes. what we can't see, the Exactly, exactly, that's spiritual. That's so that, that's the 99% and that's your, and incorporated in that 99% is your thinking, your feeling, your choosing, which is your mind, which is your mind in action and which is that links into the spiritual nature and our eternal nature and all that stuff. And that's what quantum physics, which is fundamental to every single scientific uh, field that you can go into, and it's fundamental to how we function as humans, um, is, it shows that we are basically, the, uh, the, the choices that we make as humans are impacting everything physically in our body and in the world around us. So it confirms quantum physics, which is the most accurate and fundamental of sciences, confirms that our spiritual nature cannot be ignored, that we spirit, soul, and body. So you've got the most accurate of sciences confirming our spiritual nature. So there's a lot of debate in the scientific world amongst your classical physicists that tend to say what you mentioned earlier on, that you know you can't, that science and spirituality aren't compatible. Right. But if they really look at the science, you'll have the quantum physicists who don't necessarily go to church, but they believe in a supernatural being and they believe in a supernatural source because that's what quantum physics is actually showing, that we come from the supernatural source. But they'll debate amongst each other and say, no, you, you, know, you can't see, touch, feel, and hear it, it's not important. And then others are saying, but that's only 1%, what about the 99%? 
And then the scientific studies on quantum physics show that that is more accurate actually than the physical side. So, you see, so there's a lot of debate amongst them as well. So you just made it easy for all of us whenever we're in a debate with that person who's like, well, I think this and I think science says that. Go, well, I believe in God because of quantum physics. There you go. <laughs> I don't know, it feels like, you know, like, what led you to faith in God? Uh, quantum physics. You just take a puff on a pipe, just one. You don't want to be a smoker, but you puff on the pipe for that line, and then you put the pipe down, and it's, it's a pipe dropper. Quantum there physics. There you go, totally. Boom. And well, then you don't get into the debate because it gets too tedious. Just quantum physics, look it up. So, well, it's... It's super easy to understand. It's super complex, but super easy. And it's basically taught quantum means energy, and God is the source of all energy. It's life. So quantum physics is a study of consciousness, man, life, humanity, and the impact on the role of man. So quantum physics shows us that man is, at the, is the most important part of quantum physics because of man's ability to think, feel, and choose changes who you fun how you function in the world. And that's what, you know, that's what the scriptures say. So it's From very, the beginning, very much that's the story exactly. of humanity. Exactly. We thought, we felt, and then we exactly. chose. Exactly. And so that's what we see in quantum physics is showing us. Yes, there's all the mathematical and calculation side, which shows that we're made of love and we're immersed in love. And it's really interesting. But it confirms our spirituality. And that's why I emphasize it so much. So that's, you can keep smoking your pipe. It's, it's fascinating. Very good. And <laughs> so when I, I've been following what you've been writing about uh, how we were designed, right? How God made us and how it really is all about love. Exactly. The origin, the foundation, exactly. also the goal that we're literally surrounded physically and metaphysically by love. Absolutely. So if you look at just like we can see each other, all of us physically, we can see the chairs, we can see the physical things. If we go inside our bodies, we'll see structures, we'll get down to cells, we'll get down to the proteins, eventually get to the subatomic level, and eventually you get to waves of energy. So we are the physical and our most fundamental level, we are waves of energy. And those energy, the, the, the research shows that they are these love waves. For want of another word, they're these very peaceful, calm love waves. You have yours, I have mine, everyone has their own. And we don't take each other's waves, but we enhance each other. So we work together as the body, which is what Ephesians 4.16 talks about, that we, as we come together as the body, we're going to, that's what we're designed to do. We're supposed to be, every part of the body has its own type of work, etc. We work together. So we're waves of love at our core, and that we also immersed in gravitational fields. And I feel the like one of your love waves just crashed on my shore. Good. Just now. That Absolutely. was powerful. And you can you can actually feel when, when the love wave is not a love wave. So when people are toxic, which is why I've got this little wiry tree over here that represents a toxic thought, that's generating toxic energy. Okay. And if you think of someone that, that you're in an environment with and you know they don't like you or they're angry, you actually feel like something's hitting you. You right. physically are receiving oh, that. Yeah. It's a real thing because we generate energy. So these love waves that we made of and all the parts of our body, and they, they're alive and living with this energy. So Einstein showed this, that we're generating energy. So we designed and wired for love. So all of our structures, everything about us, our circuits, our brain cells, our cells of our body, everything about us is designed and wired for love. So we're only designed to think well, feel well, make good choices, and generate love energy. But we have free will. So when we choose... God is love, and we're designed in His image, made right? Made in His image, so exactly. So we're made of love, and we're designed to generate love, and we're immersed in love. So we're not immersed in a vacuum. We're immersed in... In, well, we're we breathing oxygen, but it's gravitational fields. And they've just, um, the Nobel Prize winning scientist last year won a prize for the work in gravitational forces, which shows how we can actually show that we're immersed in these literally like universes of love waves, but they're all in a potential state, which means that we are immersed in God's wisdom. That's really what it's saying, is that you are made of God's wisdom, which is love. You're made of love at your core, and you are immersed in love. So as you think, feel, and choose in alignment with the Spirit of God, you are then going to access the wisdom of God, and you're going to turn that into a physical reality and create something. What do you create? You create thoughts. As a man thinks in his heart so easy and all that stuff, that's very real. So as you think, feel, you are generating all this energy through your unique brain in your unique way with your unique mind. So your mind is separate from your brain. So here's the brain. Okay, so the mind is separate from the brain. The mind works through the brain, so you are thinking and it uses the brain. So you generate energy through the brain. If you can bring up a slide showing this, make the glass brain. 
um, then that, when that energy moves through the brain, as you're thinking, feeling, and choosing, you are generating those patterns through this your brain. This is my brain right now, actually. This is your brain. Yeah, we, just, we just linked up Justin up. So, this. Yes, so everyone else has got a different pattern because we all have our own unique pattern, but that is the brain responding to your thinking, feeling, and choosing. If you did, you wouldn't have that firing. Wow. So your, that firing in your brain is the result of energy moving through the brain that's creating chemical reactions in the brain and electromagnetic reactions in the brain. And that causes genetic genes to express. Genes switch on, like light switches, switches on, right. genes switch on, and that makes proteins. And those proteins in the brain do what the brain needs to keep alive, and also you build thoughts. So right now you're doing this in your brain in response to our words, generating energy as you think, feel, and choose about what we're saying, and then you are turning this, my words into trees in your brain. You're growing healthy trees, not toxic trees, because I'm saying good stuff. So you are actually forming little branches made of proteins, and in the proteins the you are tree. storing, that's the good tree, Grow you are this. storing the, I noticed you put the good tree on your side, There's, and the bad tree on my side, there's a little bit of bias going on here. I really like that tree though. I know you do, so you can have it's that beautiful. one back. But it's I know the wrong it is. one. It's, 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 it's from South that's Africa. That's kind of my life though. I always like the wrong tree, well, and I have okay. to figure out how to how not like, the, like the, wrong the wrong, I build the wrong tree in my mind, and then well, then that's you been can a 30-year journey. 30-year journey. 30 journey. I think it's all of our journeys. Yeah, we do that. You see, that's the things with our free will. We can be designed to build those because we're made of love and we grow all these trees, but we can make wrong choices. We have free will. I lay before you life and death, blessing and cursing, choose. So we are supposed to be choosing on a daily basis, which is all quantum physics. As you choose, you create energy, and that energy then creates matter, and that's a thought so those, that's proteins, your thinking has built these protein trees, and those protein trees then become the foundation of what you say and what you do. So everything you say and do is first a thought. Okay, just need you to pause for a minute. Pause button. For no reason other than, right? This, it's like, this is your mind, this is your mind on Dr. Caroline. Whoa, okay, so yeah, just give us all slowly. a second to catch up, take a sip of coffee, because uh, this is deep, this is good. Uh, you know what, as I'm surfing the love wave with you right now, because that analogy works for me, right? The love wave. And I think about, okay, if all of what God created and is, if God literally is love, as the Bible says, and everything is made from Him, then everything that comes from Him, would, it would make sense that it's, it's of love. Exactly, and that's and, what science is showing us. And then I've got to choose to either ride that wave or sort of work against it. That's exactly the, what I just said, but you just said it differently. <laughs> okay. Can we all just celebrate that I was listening? <laughs> yes. Good job. All right. I thought I got it. I, I no, wanted to did. make sure. Because I'm like, you're like, uh, blah, 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 quantum physics, and I'm like, dude, let's surf the love wave. <laughs> but we're a good team that way. We're a good team, because that's what's happening. You literally are surfing the love wave. You, you're made of love. So lo I mean, when we say made of love, it sounds like some you know, metaphysical wah-wah or some spiritual woo-woo or something. But it's not. It's real, solid no, science. No, it's amazing. And it's biblical. Exactly. It's biblical. So if you, if you are angry with someone, you are actually working, you've been thinking about that feeling, choosing, building a toxic thought, and then you're talking from that toxic thought. So this is generating toxic energy. And they see from the research, it's not a love wave anymore. It's toxic. And it hits you. That's why people, you know, sometimes you might even lean back when someone is like aggressive, you know, because oh, it's yeah. those energy. And that's why we and can you also... Tense up, you tense up. Your stomach. You feel it in your stomach. Yeah. Your whole... Your your exactly. body, your face, like I get the lines when I exactly. get mad. Exactly, exactly. And, so and my daughter will say, Daddy, you have your stress face on. Well, there you go. You see, the kids are, are mirrors. They tell us what's going on. And this is the mind-brain connection, though. We control that. We design to self-regulate our thinking. And this, what I've described scientifically and that you describe with the, the surfing, and we'll show two images of that in a moment, is basically the mind-brain connection. It's the spiritual, physical link. It's the link between science and scripture, whatever you want to call it. But it's basically mind-brain. We have a love, power, and a sound mind. Those are very powerful words. We do not have yes. a spirit of fear. We do not have a spirit of fear. We have a spirit of love. Uh, and so mm. we talk about spirit. Spirit is non-physical. Non-physical is quantum. That is why science confirms what Scripture is telling us. T scripture is giving us the metaphors and the language of a story, whereas science is telling us the practical, how does that actually work in our day-to-day -day life? Right. And people battle to bridge, and you and I were chatting about this last night. People 
battle to bridge between the spiritual, I know I must bring my thoughts into captivity. I know I must renew my mind. I know I have a love, power, and a sound mind. I know I must think on these things. We can quote all the scriptures, but do we apply them? And that's right. where science is a bridge. Science is a bridge to show us, and that's what I've done with my work, work out the techniques, put it in all the materials and apps and whatever, to show people how to build that bridge on a day-to-day, moment-by-moment basis. I love it. I'm thinking about, so you, you mentioned Romans 12, that I'm transformed, I'm literally changed by the renewing of my mind. Exactly. That change starts in the mind, and then you mentioned taking every thought captive. Yes. So somehow the battle is really here, yes. and I have to figure out how when I think, how I can change how I feel and what I choose. That's the thing, because those three go together. You can never think without feeling. So when you think, you immediately feel. And when you think and feel, you will choose. So regardless of whether you like it or not, you are thinking, feeling, and choosing 40 times a second on a conscious level. Wow. But you're only aware of it every, around about every 10 seconds. So we can, six times a minute, we are designed to consciously, deliberately, and intentionally bring all thoughts into captivity. And I want to hone in on the word all, because if the scriptures say, and I've looked at multiple versions and I've tracked it back in different ways, that word all, and if you look at the definition of it in the dictionary, means all. There's no other word for it. It means everything. So that means that we are supposed to bring every single thought into captivity. None of our thoughts are meant to just be these random, and because thoughts produce words and actions. So if you don't they take us your, captive. A lot well, of times, exactly. if we don't take our thoughts captive to Christ, our thoughts take us captive. Well, you basically develop toxic habits, and you just start then, then reacting. And you're reacting mm -hmm. without, without controlling those reactions. We're designed to control our reactions. And, that's, and, it, and it's every single thought. It's not just when you come to church on Sunday, five on Monday, and the rest of the week, that's it. It's actually every thought. And the average person thinks between 30,000 and 180,000 thoughts a day. So that means, Justin, that we are supposed to be controlling our thoughts more or less every 10 seconds, which means we're supposed to be constantly self-regulating. And Socrates once said that, the unexamined life is not worth living. Mm. And if you look at throughout the scriptures and throughout the precepts in, in the Bible, and especially you see it in Proverbs, it's all about what are you thinking about? And the stories of when people don't think correctly, you know, and what, what happens in your life and the choices that people make and how we're supposed to be very deliberate and intentional about keeping our mind under control. And that doesn't just mean quoting scripture, then you're using scriptures like a magic potion which is an insult to God, and using God like a genie. It doesn't work like that. It means an intimate, deliberate, intentional, what am I thinking? Is it love? Is it going to produce love? I, you're talking about metacognition, like mm -hmm. thinking about, about what you're thinking, thinking about. Mm -hmm. Which is it, the 99%. Yeah, so because my thoughts create worlds, create exactly. realities, and I live them out. This is so good, because we're supposed to, I, I was thinking also about, it, when I actually had 35,000 thoughts while you were talking <laughs> um, between 35,000 and 180,000. Absolutely, absolutely. I only took 35,000 captive, but... Um, I got I, all the love waves hitting me. In no, I was <laughs> being crashed by love waves. Actually, they were coming from this way, right here. I think it's you, sir. Actually, I'm, <laughs> heavy, heavy. A Tahitian love wave he just sent Definitely. me. Definitely. Um, God's crazy about you. That is what we tell people. I, know, I love it. Because mm -hmm. we want to be it, it, walking in that love and that identity. Um, that we're supposed to love God with our mind. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I, th I think in a, a lot of modern Christian movements, we haven't figured out what that means. Yeah. Maybe we're chasing a feeling and I need, oh man, God had me on this high when I went to this retreat or I heard this podcast and I'm trying to get back to that place. So a lot of the time, and I agree with you, and a lot of the time what we're doing is we're filling our heads with all the things we know we're supposed to do. So we're really good at that. We're really good at gathering. We, we, our brains are designed to learn. So we love to learn as naturally as humans. But the other side of the learning is applying the learning. You know, the application, that renewing, which means a lifestyle. So you have to self-regulate. So it's not good enough just to hear the stuff. You actually have to put that into practice. You have to go beyond just being mindful of something. That's you have biblical. to actually, exactly. Don't just be a hearer of the you, word, but You've got to be do a doer and all that. Yeah. I mean, that's all these things. And this is what we see with science as well, that you're going to say something and do something anyway. This is the key thing. You are going to speak and do. That's what humans do. You, you're right. alive. So you may as well control what you're thinking so that you actually say and do the right thing 
in the correct way because you're thinking, feeling, and choosing all the time. Let me show you a slide. If we can bring up the Petri dish slide, I'm going to show you what's happening in your brain at the moment as you, you've seen the one firing. Here's now we're going to go inside the brain. We're looking at a neuron in the brain and these tree things, these tree like structures. So you're looking at thoughts. Oh, yeah. You're looking at a thought building. This is what you're doing right now as, you, as, as you're listening to me. You're generating energy. That's why it's vibrating. And that energy is causing this reaction. You, you're growing proteins in your brain. And those little branches contain billions upon billions of little minute quantum neurobiological computers. You have billions upon billions upon billions of quantum neurobiological computers that are holding this information in this, like a vibration. And that's, the, that's your mind being built then into your brain. So you're growing matter. And those, so everything you say and do is not just some random event. Everything you say and do is something you first thought about. So if, 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 if toxic stuff is coming out of your mouth, if your behaviors are toxic, you first spent at least 21 days to 63 days thinking about that. So you can't think, oh, the devil made me do it, which is a very Christian easy thing to do. The devil made me do it. It's the devil's attacking me. You know, when I hear that, I just cringe. Why not do today, we, Satan. The, it's, it's not right at all. It's giving energy to something that you shouldn't give energy to. Ooh. Whatever you think about the most is going to grow. So if you keep saying the devil made me do it, you're not taking responsibility. You're kicking God in the teeth because God said to choose the choose life or death. It's not the devil makes you choose. You choose. No one forces you to choose. Whatever you choose is going to build a thought in your brain, and that's what you're going to say and what you're going to do. So if you're thinking in a toxic way, if you're reading toxic trash, if you're constantly um, thinking about yourself, me, myself, and I, and all your issues and whatever, and just everyone's victim mentality, if you've got yourself in that pattern, that's the kind of thought you're going to build. That's what you're going to say and what you do. So no amount of going to church, reading scriptures is going to work until you choose mm. to actually get an attitude adjustment and have a look inside yourself, deep, a deep self-regulated, intentional, deliberate, why am I saying and doing what I'm doing? And it's hard stuff. It's cool stuff, but that's the reality. Otherwise, you're going to get depressed and anxious and go and take tablets and get a clinical di diagnosis of depression when it's not a disease. When it's actually depression and anxiety are telling you that there's something going on. They're simply big umbrella descriptive words that are telling you that something's going on. So when you feel nagging anxiety, when you feel depression, when you feel these um, intrusive thoughts and so on, when you have psychotic breaks, those are not diseases. What's happening there is that th that is a warning sign to you. It's a signal to you that something's going on. So you need to look at what's going on. Why do I feel the anxiety? What's worrying me? What toxic habit have I developed that I'm not dealing with? What trauma have I not dealt with? What unforgiveness is still inside mm. of me? What bitterness am I still holding? Because our body's wired for love and our brain's wired for love. So we can't hold toxicity of any form, unforgiveness, bitterness, trauma, um, bad habits, irritation, for us. we can't keep that because if we keep that, our brain is getting damaged because we don't have circuits for it. When our brain gets damaged, our body gets damaged. That brings physical and mental um, ill health. So when we talk about mental ill health is on the rise, because that's the message we're getting these days, that mental ill health is a disease and it's on the rise, that is a very bad message and it's a very unscientific message because mental ill health is not a disease. Everyone suffers from mental ill health every time we make a toxic choice. Mental ill health is a response of the human condition, going through the sufferings of life and not dealing with the sufferings of life. Right. So what we see is not that mental ill health is on the rise, but there's a mismanagement of mind leading to a mismanagement of the whole mental health concept. When we realize that there's not a single person in this room or on this planet that isn't suffering from some mental health issue because we've made wrong choices, then we normalize something that is kind of been made to be a scary thing that one in four people have a clinical depression and so on. All of us battle with depression. All of us battle with anxiety. We're all a bit crazy. We all have, because we're not always making the right choices. So we have a wonderful thing called renewing the mind, which scientifically is neuroplasticity. Neuro means brain, plastic means to change. So we are designed as humanity to self-regulate, observe our words and actions, observe our thoughts that produce the words and actions, and change them. Mm. So I did some of the first neuroplasticity research back in the 80s, showing you gotta that- You got to pause for a second. When, sorry. I have to catch my breath. Catch your breath. I had, uh, <laughs> that was so good. I was thinking one of the things that, um, I've said for years, and I'm sure you all remember, but uh, choosing, the most spiritual thing we do is choose. And I, I really, as I was thinking through what God tells us in the scripture, mm -hmm. 
uh, it comes down to obedience and doing. And spirituality is usually measured in like, well, how, how many hours did I read the Bible? How long did I pray? And do I raise my hands in worship? You know, things like, okay, that person's very spiritual because there's some outward sign. But truthfully, spirituality is about how do I choose at the end of the day? Because the most spiritual thing I do is, because I could worship for 24 hours, I could fast for a week, but if my first actual choice is I choose this tree, not this tree, to go against love, I, I choose to um, make an unkind gesture on the road to a fellow driver who I didn't know had a real life sticker till they passed me. Not me, my friend. <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> and you go, oh. That's exactly what I said as well. But as I said, you're really making it nice and simple. So you see, I can speak the science because you can translate it into something super simple. So that was exactly what's happening. Our ability to... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Our ability to choose is fundamental to us as humanity. It's a tremendous gift from God. And people often ask me, and I get asked this a lot on TV interviews and in scientific debates, if God is good and God is love and God is in control of everything, where does evil come from? And then I, my answer to that is simple. I know there's two. There's, the first of all, the general answer is the devil, because the devil's evil. But if you read your Bible, the devil was defeated. So therefore, something defeated has no power. If you read the Bible, it says, we have a spirit of love, power, and soundness. So therefore, we need to get our, our kind of perception right. We must not say that God has given us power, love, power, and a sound mind, and then think that the devil's making us do everything, as I mentioned earlier on. So I don't believe evil comes from the devil. And I'm not saying something that's out of alignment with the word of God or with scripture or spirituality. I'm saying the truth, because God has defeated the enemy and has mm. given us the love, power, and sound mind. So where does evil come from? Humanity, our choices, us abusing our spiritual nature, our ability to choose. It's so, so coming, true. Yeah. So coming along with a God who loves is a God who gave us the ability to choose, which necessitates the opportunity for evil to be created because it, you, it's, you, you can choose. Otherwise, we would be robots. We would only be operating right. in love. We wouldn't just be, we would be automatums, biological automatums, automatically all choose, or not even, because there's no choice involved. And then it's not even really love. And it's not, that's not love, exactly. Love necessitates that you could maybe choose wrong. But the whole thing with love is that you're designed to renew your mind, you're designed to change. And that's what neuroplasticity on a scientific level is telling us. You can do all this mess with your mind, which then damages your brain, because your mind is not your brain. Your mind is separate from your brain. Your mind is the 99% that works through the 1%, which is your brain and your body. So your brain just responds to your mind. So if your mind is toxic, you damage your brain, you damage your body. But if you fix, renew your mind, if you change your mind, if you change your thinking, feeling, and choosing, and build healthy thoughts, you change your brain. So your brain can heal, which is incredible. We heal our own physical bodies and minds wow. and brains. I mean, with our brains and our bodies, with our mind. Our mind is where the power resides. Wow, what a, this is good. Great way to start the new year thinking about what we're thinking about and how we control our realities. Can we role play for a second? Absolutely. Can I shoot you? Uh, okay, let's say someone sees something in life, in the computer, uh, wherever, and it's like, ooh, but it's, it's not from this tree, it's from this tree. Yeah. And it might be in a bikini or something. But anyway, <laughs> but there's an image, you know, and, and it's a, a lustful presentation of the body. So the person sees that and automatically, and maybe uh, because you built this tree, there's automatic... Uh, incli habit. inclination, habits to go towards that. So what can you do? Because the battle is right there. I've seen something that triggers a uh, thought, that triggers a feeling, that then makes me want to choose this. But God's told me not to. And then if I have done that, then I also add guilt and shame to that. So I'm like emotionally perplexed in that moment. This is a real thing. I've counseled so many people Absolutely. addicted to pornography and things. And so it's like in yep. that moment, what can I do to win that battle, to take that thought captive okay, to Christ? So First thing I want to answer is the word addiction. We all think addiction is a bad thing. Addiction means consumed by. Addiction is a good word, it's be, but it can be distorted. Wow. So we are designed to be consumed by love. Remember, we made of love, we immersed in love, and we from love. So we're designed to be consumed by love. So the addicted to love. We're addicted to love. Might as well so, face it. Exactly. I'm addicted to love. There you go. Love. Addicted to love. I'm going to so get a shirt. 
There you go, get the shirt. So therefore we need to recognize when we have a toxic addiction to something like pornography or uh, being addicted with one's victim mentality or constantly consumed with your own issues or whatever, um, whatever, you've actually taken the time to build that. We don't just automatically do things. It takes 63 days to build a habit. We've, told, we've been told it's 21 days. It doesn't take 21 days to build a habit. That's a myth. It takes a minimum of three cycles of 21 days. Your whole body physically works on these cycles when it comes to building cells and healing, etc. And then also that works in the mind as well. So therefore, to build a long-term memory takes 21 days. But to build a habit takes 63. So mm. you need three cycles. So you build the long-term memory, and then you've got to practice using the long-term memory. So let's say it's toxic. If you've got something that you keep doing all the time, you've spent at least 63 days, which is three months, practicing doing that toxic thing. So it's not just some random behavior that just happened overnight. It's something you've devoted energy and time to, which means you're going to need 63 days to rewire your brain to reconceptualize, and that's exactly what I, would, what I developed in my research, put into my books, it's in the Switch on Your Brain book, I've got an app that we're releasing very soon, and maybe they can just put that yeah, app the, on, this, on, this, on the screen while I'm switch explaining, the app. Switch, the switch, switch dot app. yeah, so there, there we go, is. so you can, you can get that, it's coming, there's, it's on pre-order at the moment, and that actually takes you through the, through the process of being conscious and deliberate, and finding these toxic areas that are causing the nagging worry anxiety, pulling them up and dealing with them. So to give your example, what I found from my research is that you can't, it doesn't just happen overnight, which I've said, but right. you've got to go through a very deliberate process. And it's five, I've simplified that down into five steps of what you do. It takes seven minutes, literally, seven to 10 minutes a day. And you just do it every day. That's what the Switch app walks you through it every day. And there's different techniques within the five steps that you can start applying. And it's stuff that's not difficult to do. It's just a habit that you create. So you create a habit of making a good habit, if you, if you understand what I'm saying. I do. So, if, well, I'm thinking about if we set our mind on things above. Well, that's exactly right? what yeah. rather than things of earth. Exactly. So I'm when I'm constantly thinking about this tree and reacting and feeling from that tree rather yeah. than I have to make a deliberate choice to go, no, let's get back to the love tree. Exactly. And let's surf the love wave and let's get back in tune with what God said and who God is, his character and nature and how he actually designed me to be that's in exactly. his image. Exactly. Then I, I take those thoughts captive and I meditate and I react and I choose in that field. I'm developing habits that then make it exactly. much easier to live here. Somewhere exactly. in here, like right here. I build a little nest. Exactly. Now you've got three million years worth of space in your brain, so you can just keep building. And the beauty of it, so what you just described scientifically, what you're doing is you are bringing, you are becoming aware of this thought. So you can't, right. if something's in the dark, you can't fix it. But if it's in the light, it changes. So what we see from science is the mm. minute that we are consciously aware of something, consciously aware, and this comes through the intentional choice to be self-regulatory and deliberate about your thinking. So you become aware. That's If you want to use spiritual terms, you're bringing it before the cross or you're confessing it. or So in other words, you're acknowledging that this is something wrong. Now, you don't go into guilt and shame, and that's something we discussed yesterday too when we were chatting, is that guilt and shame and condemnation keep you stuck. So we right. also have a lot of Christian needs teaching us a lot of guilt and shame because you're not supposed to have all these things. You're supposed to be a person of faith and confessing the word. and So it becomes this big conflict that goes on in people's minds there are more books written on, on guilt and shame in the Christian market than there is in, this, in the, any other market. So that says something, that Christians mm -hmm. are filled with guilt and shame. So I'm thinking you love God, but you're filled with guilt and shame. What's going on? So there's more depression and anxiety, or as much depression and anxiety in the church as there is in, in the world out there. So if we know Jesus, why do we have increasing levels of anxiety, depression, guilt, and shame? It doesn't make sense. So then I'm thinking, okay, well, people don't understand the process. We know what we're supposed to do, confess our sins and, and acknowledge that God and think on these things and bring us, but we're not doing that because if we were, the church would be different. It's not. So that's what the statistics show. And I can see it from my work too. We get thousands and thousands of emails every month with people really battling with the stuff. So oh, first yeah. and foremost, what I say is that's pretty normal. It's the human condition. We have struggles in life. Depression, anxiety, these are normal reactions to the struggles of life. But this is what you do. You don't get into guilt and shame. You acknowledge. Okay, so this is, this is evil. This is toxic. So don't let it control you. You control this thing. So mm. you become aware of it. Research shows that when you move something from the non-conscious mind to the conscious mind, it becomes malleable, weakened. As soon as something's weak, we can change it. Right. So this is what neuroplasticity is. This is what God has designed us to do. If you hide, if you suppress, it's strong. 
It's in the non-conscious mind. Right. But if you are, if you are um, hu humble enough to say, I've got this really bad habit, or I have suffered this trauma, I need to forgive, or whatever, you are making this weak. Now it's weak. Now you can change it. Now it can go away. So now you go through the process. Once you have developed this, this is kind of almost a meditation process where you acknowledge and confess, whatever. Now you need to do what most Christians don't do because they don't know how to do it because no one teaches them. So let me teach you the basics and the switch app and my books have got it in You depth. know what we always say is to get right with God, you have to get real with God. Yeah. And that's have, one of the, we've tried to build a church where people can come in and go, hey, I'm so-and-so and I struggle with this. And it's like perfectly normal rather than coming to church, country club for saved people, you got yeah. a safe face, nobody can see that you have Exclusive any problems. Country club, yeah. It's really like, because when, when we can acknowledge that and exactly. bring it to the forefront, we can actually change it. Well, that's the thing, then we can change. And okay, once keep you going, change, what's step two then? So then step two basically deals with non an analysis of this. So why am I feeling the anxiety and depression? What is this thing? It's got many branches, so there's many associations. So it might initially be um, a lustful thought, may actually be at the core some kind of abuse that you suffered as a child and it's just been become a toxic addiction and it's manifesting in that inability to really get into a deep relationship so you're hiding under, I don't know, I'm just going down a track That's here, one, but two. you it's there's many reasons why we do what we do and because we're all unique you can't in, there's no one pattern, you can't say if this happened then that will happen because you're different to me and I'm different to you so we have to acknowledge our unique story and you're doing stories at the moment in your series, everyone has their own unique story, the current mental health system, if someone is going through, let's say that they are have been through the um, a, a child who's beha behaving very difficultly and they throwing tantrums and they just the terrible behavior issues they're very often labeled with ADD which is not a scientific category it's not it, it doesn't even exist it's just a it's just a theory and then they told they have bipolar and they told they have this meanwhile that child who's acting up could have been a child who was from parents that were drug addicts thrown in the foster care system raped multiple times bullied multiple times which is very often the history of the shooters that we're seeing in this country I've done lots of podcasts by the way and TV shows on the stuff that I'm talking about now at the speed of light. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff where they can go, you can dig deeper into my materials and things for this information. But essentially to tell someone who's been through um, a tra traumatic incident that they have clinical depression and they fill in a form and will ask some questions and 15 minutes later your story hasn't even been considered, right. that's wrong. You see, you have a story, here's your story. There's a reason why you are acting out in some way in your life or experiencing depression or whatever. There's something that's happened. So that's why the second step is to deal with a process of thinking it through. We have to land the plane. We have to land the plane, okay. I'm having well, so much fun surfing the love wave. I know, so am I. We have well, to just they can find the information in the book and the Switch app. The Switch app, the switch.app online, because that'll be out very soon. Very soon. And there's the devotional that's just been released as well, which takes us in small little daily chunks. And there's tons of information to help people. This, is, this has been so helpful. What a way to start the new year, right? Thinking about how God's designed our brain. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Caroline. And uh, with 17 books, I think there's probably a lot we could continue to say. But I, I've, you've helped me today. So I know you've helped a lot of people, and uh, I'm just going to close us in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for uh, what you're doing in and through Dr. Caroline Leaf. I love her and what she's doing, her mission to help us all. She's uh, lifted some burdens, I think, off a lot of people with the labels and the different things that, that it's actually okay. We have these thoughts, but Lord, you've given us the ability to take these thoughts captive and bring them to Jesus and, and run them through a filter of love and perfection and wisdom that will allow us to then make better choices that will create a new reality and a new world for us. And uh, Lord, it's what your word says, it's what we see, and as we choose evil, we see what happens from the very first story in the Bible all the way through. And when we choose love, we see what happens. And so God, thank you so much for sharing this stuff in your word, but thank you for bringing the good doctor in today to open our minds to how you created our minds. And Lord, we wanna set our minds on things above and, and just be glorifying you inside and, and outside. So we love you and thank you for this moment today. I pray some people are forever changed in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, Dr. Caroline Leaf. Thank you so much.